Ukila kila o haleakala ikala i ho o lo no palike aikana ulu ulu lo a o mauna kapu kapu ike kupa kupa manawa hua yo pilio kahe kahe vale ke aloha he aloha no nana kulie. Aloha mai e nā hoa mā ke e aloha aina. He panela ke ia e hoolauna ia nei ke kahi o nā hulu kupuna o ka aina o wai anai. He papahana i hookumu ia i mā ka mahina o yulai no ka hoike ana i ko kākou ea. A ke ano e pono wai nā kānaka i loko o ke ia i ke ana ka noo noo ana, ka hao mana o ana i ke ia o ka aina Ano lila, e hoolauna ia ki a panela i ike e holomuai ko kakou ea holo o koa Aloha everyone, my name is Kalihua Krug and I'm going to be the moderator of this panel In this month of July, one of the things that we are trying to focus on here uh, with the Ma Malo monologues um, is the aspect of Ea. Um, as we are in the month of July, uh, July 31st being La Hoi Hoi Ea, it's really important to begin um, and continue conversations about the concept of Ea, but also in this particular panel, uh, the concept of um, Kane, masculinity, and the progression that many of uh, us have walked through as Kane and the progression that our sons are walking through and all the sons of our collective Lahui are walking through. And so what this panel is, it's, a, it's to honor um, through our collective memory, um, the, the hulu kupuna that are sitting next to me here. Um, and I'm gonna briefly introduce all of them and give them a space to introduce themselves to you uh, because we here are honored to hear the words that they're going to share with us today, especially as it pertains to um, understanding uh, through a historical lens the concept of Ea for, Ea for us as a people and, and Kane. And so who I have here sitting to my left uh, is Mr. Sparky Rodriguez. And uh, he has many, many experiences that you are all going to hear about, but primarily being a part of Malama Makua and the arduous task of uh, understanding uh, the legal ramifications, understanding the ecological ramifications, and understanding the community ramifications um, of the bombing and the desecration that took place in Makua. And so he has a lot of experiences in Aloha Aina and uh, bringing back Ea to a space. And so Sparky, mahalo for being here. Yeah. We also have uh, Mr. Eric Enos. And of all the names uh, on this panel, uh, this is one that um, I think I remember farthest back uh, because of his work with Ka'ala Farms and all of the stories in our community of uh, Aloi being brought back to life um, in the back of uh, Waianae Lualuale. Um, and so in all of that work through the community action, community organization, um, and seeking a, a, a method and mechanism by which um, restoration can happen um, on a scale in an agricultural space. Um, and I know it's much, much more diversified now. Um, but I, I recall that as uh, a youth in my 20s, um, as one of those a really significant, significant turning points in my life, encouraging me to take on greater responsibility for my community. So, Anakala Eric, mahalo for being here. Uh, and finally, on the end, um, is uh, I'm going to say in our com community, a master thinker, um, a, a, a master member of um, our intellectual uh, collective. And uh, his name is Poka Lai Nui. And as we sit here at the School of Kawai Hono Kana'awao, he was also one of the founding members that had the foresight to understand uh, not just educationally, but through uh, social development and community organization, the needs of a community on the Waianae coast um, and bringing 
that intellectual uh, thought space to our community to uplift us all as a collective and uh, promote uh, the, the movement forward for all of us. So I want to thank you very much, Poka, for being here. Um, now I'm going to pass it over to Anakala Sparky and let him uh, speak a little bit about um, his experiences. And, and in this introductory space, uh, space is to really uh, allow them to talk about um, when given the opportunity to introduce yourself, what are the key target points that they recall? Um, and progressing through that introductory space into one where the major component of what we're speaking about today is how have um, their experiences um, affected the way that we as Kane in this generation, we as Kanaka in, in this generation, have gotten to the place where we are talking about cultural um, uh, issues. We are talking about issues of Aina. And of course, for us at Ma uh, Malo Manalogs, that we are actually looking at um, wearing our clothing, wearing our dress as a way to show our air as Kanaka. And so I'm gonna start off with Ana Anakala Sparky here um, to continue that story uh, and, and introduce more uh, his experiences. Mahalo, uh, Sparky Rodriguez, um, wine Chinese Portuguese. Uh, Portuguese side came from Madeira, and uh, the ship that they were on was the Thomas Bell. The king ended up paying for a lot of the Portuguese to come to Hawaii because they ended up coming with skills that ended up helping the economy as well as the growth and uh, prosperity within Hawaii. Chinese side, I know very little about, but they came out of southern China. Um, Hawaiian side, my great grandmother out of Waipio Valley. Um, and I had a chance to go uh, with some family and found where she was buried in Waipio. So it, as I find and do research on the Hawaiian side, I find that there's more connection. It goes deeper and deeper, and we find and finding that we're all related, which is even more scary, because at that point there's no separation. A um, little bit about the education component. I started out at the Grace Catholic. St. Patrick's was the school. Uh, fourth grade, I asked the priest, "Tell me about God," and he said, "You just gotta believe." And I figure if the priest, who's the expert, couldn't explain God to me, a fourth grader, then all the other stuff they were trying to teach me was all BS. So I resisted in the fourth grade. They kicked me out, went to Aliolani school. Um, at that point, it was really the Hawaiian side. I knew a lot of uh, Hawaiian students, but I really felt alienated. I felt separate. And I felt really embarrassed to be Hawaiian. And that was just part of the history. Um, my grandmother lived in Makaha, so spent a lot of time on this side. Um, and they call it Secret Beach. A lot of turtles go in there, but that's where I learned how to pick limu, fish, swim, even though they're all only rocks. And started to have an affection for the, uh, the, the ocean. So as I grew up, became a diver and dove all over, especially uh, Makapu was my favorite place. Hiked down the cliff, swim across the flat island. Uh, He'e was my, also one of the things that really gravitated uh, to me. Uh, we'd go diving for red and silver fish. Uhu if they got in the front of the spear, but normally that's all we went for. We didn't go in clean everything out, and we only captured what we wanted that we would eat. So my grandmother would say, get me a white eel, so we'd go look for them. And that's what she would end up making, vingador style. Yeah. Um, and growing up was really tough. I almost died so many times. It's amazing I survived my childhood. Uh, almost drowned several times. Uh, got stuck on a cliff once, and I don't know how I got off but there was no rescue. And it got, uh, the, my dive partners and we would say to each other, if you're drowning, save your own life. We were always aware of each other. We always kept track of each other. 
So we never abandoned each other, but we also put responsibility on ourselves to make sure that we were safe. And we never do too many stupid things. Um, the Makua story started with my wife and I separating. And she lived on the beach at Makua with about another 300 Hawaiian mostly that were homeless. Our relationship was broken at the time. And she was on the Kahanaiki side. So we have Kahanaiki, Makua, Koyahi in that big valley area. Kahanaiki is where we had a chance to look inward and to explore ourselves, and to use the aina to heal our relationship. Kayatana at the time said, no, you cannot. You gotta be pow by this date, and if you're not, you're out of there. So getting arrested ended up helping me not be afraid of breaking their law. I didn't feel I was breaking the law to heal our family. And using the aina as a path to do that. Out of that, we ended up running into a peace and justice group that was at the gate at the Life Fire Range at Makua. Fred Dodge was one of them. He just passed recently. DeAndre and I came from more of the Hawaiian. How do we heal ourselves as Hawaiians? Uh, she was there and she taught me a lot by being quiet, listening to the aina, and following the spirit that calls us to do things. So our intuition. And with that has helped me understand more about the aina. And the definition that I use for aina is um, everything. It's everything. But it's not only the physical presence, but it's also the one that we don't see beyond the veil. The spiritual part as all part of our aina. And the problem that it created is because we looked at the army as being our adversary, our enemy. And if everything is incorporated in Aina, they're our family too. Aina was the old word, old, the ancient word for in Hawaiian for, for family. But we limited to our relationships, Aina, Ohana, or just the ground, or just the mountain, or just the field. But in reality, it's everything. So the spiritual, the emotional, the physical, the mental, this is Aina. And until we have that imbalance, that pono that we constantly search for, goes beyond just this physical body. And that's kind of a little bit about what's going on for me and a little bit of the introduction. So um, now the military is not the enemy, they're family. They're just behaving badly. <laughs> and they're not pono with the aina. So how do we relate to that? I mean, for me, it's, it's constantly reminding them, hey, you're part of the family behave. So that's my short, maybe too long story. Awesome. I'll call it Eric, same question. Hello, my, uh, I was intimidated by talking in front of people, but uh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Two old warriors. <laughs> same story. And Pokama tell the same story too. I mean, we're all, our story is all, uh, uh, you know, when you weave in hala, you know, and have all the pieces, when you try to figure out the pico in the hala, yeah, I mean, I was, my friend was harvesting hala and planning work for the which tree you're going from, or trees at Kaala, it's so dry, crack hot, you gotta really bring the water back, you gotta blow me the leaf back, get beautiful love, and I feel sorry for the tree, yeah, because no more enough weavers, yeah. no more enough weavers. And no man, it's like how we, that we was harvesting kapa and wauke for make for, for the kukuna, but you know, not enough malawake. Nanakuli was very famous. I want malawake in Nanakuli. I never know that. Had Nanakuli get water, get water, but it's getting, it's wuna. And it all comes up there. Yeah. And and I still, if you can do something for me, is find another name for that pond. Because that's heaven right now. Yeah. 
steam pot. Wow. It's like it's like the stigma. And I'm still trying to find it. But you know, that's so the story is gonna be really important because our story is a story of struggle. Trying to, you know, because we come from different places. Our ancestors came on canoe, they came on a sailing ship. Um, and um, so and we get our connections to each Mokoya yeah, and, and each Pai Aina. So, um, but the struggle is to bring back, for us is to bring back the Pai. Yeah. And, uh, and my first understanding of what is Hawaiian was Nanakuli Park working with the Park Gang. My first introduction into the Kanaka subculture and then also the culture of the Hawaiians in charge and how a lot of our Hawaiians in charge, you know, and I came from that generation before me was to be American and Western Asian, so I couldn't understand it. Uh, I got to Kapalama High to the back door. Uh, my sixth grade teacher shake his head and I don't see how you got accepted. That's true, because I hated school. But my cousin was dying of uh, leukemia. And he was a model student. Uh, and the principal asked him, what can he do? And he said, get my cousin in. But I know I was smart because we never had TV. And we had books, we read, 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 read. And when I elementary, I used to love when the book mobile come. Because my whole world was understanding books. Because it was for read, 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 read. Yeah. Um, just read everything you could consume. So that was the advantage of the more TV. Yeah. But now I think we're going to get big lost generation. Everything is on the screen. I saw one uh, good friend of ours, Barry Sanova, and he was must have been in his uh, 12, 13. All the way from town, stopped the car, he couldn't get out of the car, he couldn't get away from the street. So, addiction, yeah. heroin, cigarette, pick up, all addictions, yeah. he is still with us. So, I mean, those are the struggles we get right now. So, uh, you know, we all pass up. Our, our land is idle. We get land, we get water, we get kanakas. We have plenty of aina. We get plenty of water. No tell people to stay that no more water. Get water. Yeah, but it doesn't. You know, we have climate change, we get drought, and we get plenty of kanaka. But they're all silo. 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 So, our food is still 80% imported. So you are what you eat. So I put on. So how do we? How much one bag put? Ten. One bag put. Feed you. How much is that? Eight dollar. Eight dollar. Oh, cheap. I see more. Yeah. One one bag. Yeah, I saw ten dollars. Yeah, I see places fifteen dollars on bag. So, so you know you gotta be wealthy to be Kanaka. So that's why we. I mean, so anyway, so that's my challenge. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on. Kala, you know, and before that, Kala struggling. Uh, we, know, we know more enough Kanakas taking care of the land because they need job, yeah. Uh, but uh, how do we make the land? We get plenty of land idle. Lulu Lay is idle. Deep soil, get plenty of water. So my proposal is that we set aside the Aina and we get the funding for us to live off the grid, you know, and we get everybody get at least one acre. But you gotta get enough water, and and you gotta park, you, you cannot make a parking lot. I see plenty of lots, all parking lot, all cars, you know, people growing cars. And so uh, and uh, but we gotta come so. I know I make aloha in a hulu manoliki only. I am from the area of Waianae. I'm going to put this down because to demonstrate my understanding of Kane, I will demonstrate it in movement for a short period of time and then I will explain further. And forgive me if I cannot move appropriately, I just got my dialysis.
greetings to all my relations and step into the house of Tai Chi. I form the symbol of Wu Chi, the symbol of oneness of everything. And then I begin the movement of yin and yang, the Tai Chi symbol. In the form here, follow with an explanation. The opening symbol of Wu Qi talks about the very beginning of time in which everything was contained, nothing created, nothing destroyed. The essence of the beginning of everything, the oneness of it all. And out of the Wu Qi, you have the separation between Tai Chi, the movement, the yin and yang principle. Once you create one aspect, you create a yin, automatically you have yang. Once you exhale, you would have to inhale. Once you even think about what is right, you automatically create what is wrong. Once you think of Kane, you have to think of its make, Vahine. You cannot separate these issues. Once you have day, you have night. And in this practice, this form, what I was trying to demonstrate, not necessarily by words, but by physical awareness, the differences and the similarity, they're all the same, and yet they all have their own qualities. In the Tai Chi practice, we talk about the civil aspect, peaceful, calm. But within the civil aspect, every move has a martial aspect as well. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's no such thing as Kane without Wahine. There's no such thing as day without night. There's no such thing as yin without yang. You know the two fish symbols that you see? You have the black fish with the white eye, and you have the white fish with the black eye. Within yin, you have yang. Within yang, you have yin. Nothing is always that pure. Within male, you have the effeminate, the female. And to deny that aspect of yourself, irrespective of what kind of growing you have, 
we are all male and female, maybe to a different extent. But there's a oneness, and once you try to separate that oneness and be only one kind or the other kind, you deny yourself the humanity that you are. I had a long explanation comparing the Chinese concept of Wu Qi, very similar to the Hawaiian concept of Po. In the very beginning was Po. The Kumulipo tells you about it. Everything was so deep and so dark. That was it, no more, nothing else. But out of that came Ao, came light came a different aspect, but it was still part of Paul. And then you had the divisions of the land and the ocean and the rest. But it all goes back that we are all created of the same creational force. One last thing is the idea of Ea. And my training in the Hawaiian aspect, and this comes from Pilahi Paki, is that the original gods of Hawaii were not Kane, Lono, Ku, Kanalo. They were sounds. You go back to even Christian theology. In the beginning was what? God? No. In the beginning was a word. What is a word? It's a sound. In the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. First primary is the word, the sound. So as we hear the sound, Ea. What is that telling us? You have some essential sounds in the Hawaiian language that represents the God elements. You have the sound of light, of life, of kane, fire. That's one element. But you also have the element of time, the movement, the air. Sometimes we cannot understand time. We don't know how it exists, but when it manifests in itself in winds, you can feel it. And you sometimes you will feel it so strong that there's no resistance. You can put Donald Trump's great wall up. The hurricane still won't break it. That's the force of A. You have the other force of E, the Kai and the Vai. The Vai being the fresh water, the Kai being the salt water. Both of these are essential elements in the Hawaiian belief system. And then you have the O element, the Honua, the stability in life. And then finally you have what many other traditions do not have, and that is the U element, the human element. Each of these elements have particular responsibilities. They have been deeded certain claims, certain rights. But the U element is very interesting because is it, it is through the ability to form language, the ability to form sounds, that you can control the other four elements. And so by the power of voice, if you know how to use it appropriately, you can control these elements. And Tipilahi would always say, when it's not just making sounds, not simply babbling. It takes a thinking mind and a feeling heart if it's only a thinking mind and you hear a person talking, then it's merely an intellectual exercise. Oh, good lecture, I heard it before and I, I really agree or disagree with the 
speaker, but there's no power behind it. If it's based only on the gut feeling, then the owl, it comes from the gut, and you have somebody screaming about the injustices here and there and all that stuff. It doesn't carry the power. It's only the babbling of an angry person. But you connect up the thinking mind and the feeling heart, and you push it out through a voice that has an understanding of the use of sounds, of an understanding of the use of words, then you have an unstoppable force. And so we deal with the term Ea. What is Ea? For me, I interpret it as A being the processing, the movement of time, and A being life itself. That ea is, some people now interpret it as sovereignty. But it is a control over a period of time of our future ea. I'm sorry for taking so long. That's my short explanation of that. Oh, beautiful. Mahalo. I think um, the, and I want to modify a little bit of um, base of what you uh, three have shared, that part of what we are trying to do here is share a message. And um, in that message, um, really analyzing what are the historical pieces um, from the things that you folks have seen that must come forth. And I, and I think, um, you know, with, Poka, your explanation of air, um, that's kind of in the same vein of what I'm thinking about, is that how do those understandings um, from Anake Pilahi, how do we move that into the future? Um, and and, and, and uh, I'm, I'm phrasing it this way, what are those pieces that was, must come forward? And then what are the ways, the methods that um, you, if you could share with, with uh, us or the younger generations, how would the, how would we action them actually moving forward? Anybody want to start with them? I had a chance to sit with uh, Kahuna Sam Lono in the past, and I was so afraid of him, I never say nothing. But I always went with questions, and he always answered the questions I brought. And I sh my cousin shared with me that it was one of the things that he asked was that, what is the one thing that Hawaiians are, are faced with? And he said, the, the thing that is most challenging is doubt. The thing that keeps us back, that keeps us from moving forward. And growing up, one of the things that was really dominant in my life was fear. I feared the ocean, I feared the shark, I feared the, the eel, I feared the wave, I feared everything. Getting stuck on that cliff, I was petrified. Being in front of the, the school and a class play in fourth grade, I was frozen and I was all the way out of the sight of everybody. But I could see that and it froze me. The doubt of being able to survive or even behave in that way. The first time I was given a mic or to share a story was at Makua on the Papua. And Pui Pao and Joan sent me out. I was sitting down and my legs were like jello. My hands was dripping with sweat out of fear. But I was also really pissed at Cayetano because his threat to all of the people that had no other way to overcome. And our goal was to, to a long-term solution to homelessness. That was our goal. And he said, no, you know, can't. And then starting to understand that there was this separation, even in school, fifth grade, you have to work in a cafeteria. And that time, all of a sudden, all of the workers outside banging pots, because it was statehood. They were celebrating statehood. And I didn't find out for decades after what that really meant to the <coughs> and how it was, 
imposed on us and stolen the independence. So I was born in a territory. <clears throat> but overcoming the fear to challenge, risking death, uh, coming back from Vietnam, the problem that I had was loyalty and uh, patriotism. How do I separate that American education upbringing of being a citizen of America? And then realizing that there's Hawaiian in there. So how do I separate that? And it took me a long time to figure out that I'm not anti-American, I'm not anti-military, I'm pro-Hawaiian, pro-Aina. And it gave me a place to stand so that I could overcome that, that fear and the upbringing of being American, raised in an American educational system that still exists today and still wants us to be workers, it still wants us to be in control, in their control, and they don't want us to be thinking. They don't want us to take action. First time I was in Makua, trying to get in, they had MPs with M16s, full flat jackets, helmets, sidearm, and that's how they greeted us. Having to stand there and be challenged, unarmed, and totally raw and naked, I mean, it, it takes some courage. Back then, I was just stupid. I never know any better. But it was something, just standing for the fear, like with Pui Pong guys, tell us the story about Makua and me freaking out because of the microphone, because of the, the camera. And I found that our people really struggle with their words. Growing up, it would get stuck right here. And I couldn't talk. I couldn't share my feelings. I couldn't share the words. So it's taken decades to overcome that fear, but to the point where I feel that I, that's one of the strengths that I have, especially when I'm talking to the military, when we go in there, you guys are occupying illegally. You guys have invaded. It's time for you guys to clean up, pack up, and leave. Even to the generals that come down and say, oh, I just took command of the 25th. Yeah, bro, but you, you've been here two weeks and you already burned the place. So it's not, I don't know if it's my sarcasm, my stupidity, or just my, the spirit that comes in and say, you gotta say it. So, it's my two cents start. If I remember the question correctly, what do we need to bring forward? And I agree totally with uh, Sparky that we have to be willing to challenge and not continue with doubt. Let me tell you a different way of putting it. And that was in my conversation, many of you may be familiar with Wilford Kalaauhala Pulava, who was uh, reputed on the world leader of Hawaii. And he said that when he saw a man get shot up into the moon, he was watching te television. And at that moment in time, all impossibilities left his vocabulary. And he said, no. Because they always told him, you can never organize. You Hawaiians can never organize. You're fighting among yourself, you're fighting with the Samoans, and you would have to follow the Japanese or the Haole or the Koreans in terms of who leads gambling in Hawaii. And when he saw that occur, he said, bullshit, I'm going to organize. Uh, I'm going to organize the Hawaiians. I'm going to team up with Alema Leota. Uh, with the Samoans, and we're going to take over this darn place. The word impossibility has to leave our vocabulary. When I was in the Air Force, and I joined during the Vietnam War, and I was stationed at Hickam Air Force Base, and as I walked through the library, it, it's like a book fell off the, the shelf. And I looked at it and it says, Hawaii's story. By Hawaii's queen. And I said, you know, I spent four years at the University of Hawaii. I never came across this book. And so I started reading it. And here I am with the uniform of the Air Force. 
reading Lilio Kalani's story. And I was so pissed off. Well, what can be done? And so I started plotting and planning to kill Americans to get the Air Force and all military establishments out of Hawaii. And then I realized they won't catch me. I'm not going to go very far. So instead, I decided to change path. I got to go back to law school. And once I get a degree and I get into the courts, then I can explode the system with truth, with history, with honesty, with aloha. And after that, I graduated, I came out to Waianae, opened my law practice, 1976. And then my brother calls me, hey, bro, we get somebody who needs help. I say, yeah, who? He said, well, just a not of Hawaiian. I said, yeah, all the Hawaiians need help. <laughs> he said, well, uh, can you go see him? I said, who are you talking about? And why don't the guy come see me? He says, well, he's in uh, federal prison up in uh, Washington State. And who is this guy? Oh, he's Nappy Pulago. I said, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> I never had a criminal case, never represented anyone, and he wants me to go represent Nappy Pulago. In a conversation I had with Nappy up in uh, uh, federal prison in Washington, I say, how you expect me to defend your case? He said, I don't know. What would you do if you was a the defendant? I said, well, if I was a defendant, this is what I would say. When they charge me with double murder, double kidnap, my response would be, I refuse to dignify this court by even entering a plea. Instead, I ask, who are you foreigners to come into Hawaii and steal our sovereignty from us? And his response was immediate. He says, sounds good, but I never heard the story before. He had not known of the overthrow. So I sat down and I said, well, let me tell you the story. And so we went through that and he became educated and he says, okay, I'm willing to take that defense. And so my response is, you know, should the jury not buy your defense? They're going to nail you for the rest of the life, your life, you're going to stay in jail. He says, I don't care as long as I can carry the story to just one more Hawaiian to tell them about what has happened. I'm willing to take the chance. So we proceeded with the case. It ended up as the longest criminal case in Hawaii's history up to that time. And uh, there's many other dramas in the case, but the end result was a jury found him not guilty of double murder, double kidnap. Notwithstanding the fact that the, the forces in Hawaii, both the federal strike force and the state Prosecutors had teamed together and had put so much effort in nailing this Hawaiian and throwing him in jail for the rest of his life. So the fear that it might not happen, we're all afraid, we're all scared. They threatened to take my law license away because I stick to this principle. But somehow we need to learn from others, we need to learn our history, and we need to be true to ourselves. I was up at the dojo up in Kalihi, where there's, uh, there's Buddha head. And that's what he calls himself. He's the, the archbishop of this uh, church, the Daihon Zen Chozenji. After Sam King threatens to take my license away, because I refuse to say that I am a U.S. citizen. 
And as a result, I say, if that's the case, take the damn thing. Give up the license. He said, well, I'll wait 30 days and uh, we'll have uh, what is called an artificial cost. Anyway, the other story is that I go down to the dojo and uh, the priest, the head priest there says, you know, you have to remember that the quest is not to walk the straight path, but to learn to walk the crooked path straight. So I'm sitting over there and he throws me one of these, what they call koan, these riddles. I say, oh yeah, I know. I don't know what they mean, but I know. <laughs> but cocky. <laughs> The quest is not to walk the straight path, but to learn to walk the crooked path straight. The American system imposed in Hawaii is a crooked path. It lies, it cheats, it steals from us. And they expect us to be loyal American citizens. So, the answer is not for me to go throw stones or rockets at the system, but to get inside the system and be pono as I walk through the system. Mm. The quest is not to walk the straight path, but to learn to walk the crooked path straight. And I think that's what we need to educate our children we need to educate even the foreigner, those people who we see as enemies today, we need to constantly educate. Okay, thank you. I met the Boka, so I'm at the University of Hawaii. You uh, talk about transformation from one Respect one to the other, holy, totally holy. I remember Oliver Lee, and he was arguing in Vietnam because we, we we came out of the bit. I never went Nam because I refused to go. I told him it's an immoral, well, it's, well, it's an immoral war by military industrial complexes. Ho Chi Minh was fighting the French. The colonizers was taking over his country and he fought, and every of those people went down into their tunnels and they fought, the, they fought the invading army. How you like if we was, Hawaii got invaded? But you see, plenty Kanakas. I went to a school where they trained us to be good and industrious, white men and women, and was all military careers. I mean, I, I, not to say anything, because that's the jobs that the recruiters was all recruiting, because you get housing, you get everything. I mean, you know, I understand it. I understand it. My, my dad worked pro hub all his life, yeah. So I'm not gonna Lulu Lip, all our jobs. So when Walter Reed and them when to go invade Kaolave and um, Helm them and Mitchell and all those brothers, you know, Hawaiians was upset. Let me tell you, it was unpopular. <laughs> unpopular. Because everybody was American. I, rem I remember the door stop in Palolo housing. I was on stone, shaped like this. That was my introduction, that's when those stuff started all over. That's all I knew. I mean, and I'm an educated man. Eight boy, one day a year. I could run I, I, 100 yards, strip on M1, and run back. It was good, it was good. But I never buy into it, because I could read, I read the history, read the history, and I'm like, wait a minute, immoral. It was unpopular. Yeah. After you went Huli, he wasn't popular anymore. <laughs> that was court martial. <laughs> exactly. And he the only guy who was talking sovereignty when everybody was well, they couldn't they, they, that was on foreign word sovereignty was on. That was hundred years ago, no literally. And they had one T shirt, they had one T shirt. And the, the, the was the white face ripping off. And underneath was the brown face. That was his t-shirt. That was the sovereignty. So how to understand sovereignty? Because we was angry. When I found out the history, I was pissed off. My friends came back from Nam. I refused to go. 
military never like wanted nothing to do with me, but I put my energy into the island. So that's what I am. And I had to learn the culture, and I had to ask for forgiveness when we brought the water down and not ask for permission. You cannot ask for permission when you put but, you know, But we gotta go back to the island. We gotta go back, we gotta go back to our food. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, cannot be Hawaiian flying on uh, made in Taiwan flag, yeah. And running a $200 gas bill for rally. Uh, sorry, because we gotta go on. We gotta, and we cannot just go up there and like this, yeah. That's our leader waiting, you know, waiting for handout. That's why the statue. There's a reason why they had it up there like that, you know, because the hand's supposed to be. Kulika Nima. Otherwise, Puruli. So they taught us to, you know, wait, stand in line and wait. And they killed our reef for the kind of agriculture. So when rain, all the mud go, cover the coral, and it's all gone, yeah. So anyway, I mean, so that's the battle environment. Social justice, gender justice, yeah. Hawaiians had more than one. So we've been taught the religion that if you mahu, you want a kind, you know, so you tease, you do everything, but that was not our culture, yeah. So anyway, you know, so. But see, those are radical, radical ideas, and many Hawaiians, you know, are still not. I mean, we, we cannot struggle with it, but I'm so glad what you guys are doing, so glad to the Kanakas out there, you guys, like, you guys planning, 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 Aloha and Mahalo. Because it is a struggle, but we gotta do them right. We gotta like be like the most powerful thing we get is aloha. Because when you get angry, then you lose it. In martial arts, as soon as you're angry, you, you, you lost the battle. You gotta be calm, cool, and you gotta wait. And force calm, look that force in the eye, and you step aside. <laughs> His dance was really at the base of power and energy. Energy calm. Let them go, let them go. You know, so you gotta know how to understand. Just like you see the kids in front, Nanakulia, the waves boom, all inside there. The tourists go there, they drop. No, serious, right there, they drop. I seen it because they take all these kids, all these kids, they jump in the water, the wave, boom, but the kids go up. The tourists go there, boom, boom, boom. By the time you get there, they, you know, I seen Nanakulia pop. Yeah. But I understand how power. Oh, it's something you need to understand, and you need to understand where the power will come from. Above, mm. below, mm. Ike. Mm. So, wow. Well, I think uh, we have a <clears throat> special guest, uh, because as usual, when we sit with folks of uh, uh, your level of, your folks' level of understanding and, and, and wisdom, time flies. Um, but I, but I do want to uh, open up any opportunity right now before we bring on our special guests um, to share any, any final thoughts, any final words. I spent six months up on the Mauna. And before I went up there, before even the Kupuna line was set up, um, I heard the sound bite. To me, it was a sound bite, Kapu Aloha. No idea what that meant. It's easy to define and explain the definition, but to experience it. I was on the fourth line, the cops, all the arrests happened, but they stopped, so I never got. They said, hey, what about us? They said, well, we power already. Four o'clock, we're going home. <laughs> but leading up to that point, everybody, the cops showed up and the tension went up, and there were guys doing a kuma mall. And you could feel everything getting hot, and the cops on the side were poised and ready to respond. And then the ladies that was in front of the kupuna, some of them started saying, Aloha, eh, Aloha, eh. And the tension went from here to here instantly. Everybody moved to the side of the road and sat down. And the cops were there saying, What is going on? We don't know how to deal with peace. These guys want to hit, I know how to deal with that. They can break our heads. We were expecting it. I expected to die up there in the world because we didn't know what they were gonna do. Out of all the anger, that 
heart, LOA really gave us peace to settle down and be ready. The cops had no idea how to handle Kupuna, which was really unusual. Normally the young Turks are up front and they're ready to beef, but they were all asked to move to the side and sit and be quiet. So there was no yelling, no screaming, no swearing, and the cops couldn't handle. My anger with the military at the beginning, coming at us with weapons. I was pissed. So we treated them angrily. And it got to the point until we started bringing peace and calm into my, our own bodies and minds that they didn't know how to handle us. And it got to the point where now they want to be friends, but we know they game. And we've been doing this for 20 years. Makua starts 19 years of peace, no live fire, uh, in August. I mentioned fifth grade, but statehood. The feds and the state had five years to resolve all leases, all land tenure. All the leases that were started come to 2029. They will start renegotiating 2026, which is BS because they already started. And why not? Deep Draft Harbor, when they dug it, high incidence of cigaterra on the coast. Then you end up with uh, the tourist center out here, denying us access to the ocean. <coughs> then you got Waimanalo, Mauna Waimanalo Gulch, which is now hundreds of feet above uh, where the valley used to be. Then you got Kahi Point, creating power for everybody. Nanakuli, the highest population of, uh, of Hawaiians. Then you got the uh, Mauna PVT over here, all the construction waste that comes to, to Waianae. Luulule, all gated, armed guards, no evacuation plan for any of the coasts if there's an emergency for us to go maka. No can go. As you're going down, you got Luulule, the ultra low frequency communication center. That's how to communicate with the submarines. That goes through all of us, every day. As you're going further down, Schofield, we're all downwinders from all the Schofield training. When they burn that place, my yard is full of black from all the ash that gets blown over. So my grandkids are breathing that shit. And you go further, you got Makua. They've been bombing since the late 20s. 2029, 20, 100 years of bombing, contamination, OBOD site, dumping contaminated fuels and jet fuels and stuff like that in the valley. And initially the generals and the colonels said, no worry, the thing stopped at the fence. <laughs> now, as we found on the top of Kaena, you got all the golf balls the leases come to 2029. And I believe every single military and government facility has taken land and expanded their ownership or control beyond the amount that they're paying for. Like I said, Makua, $1 for 100 years. Then, well, they don't use them for 100 years. The lease only started from 64 to 2029. So, but they never even give the dollar. So the 20 percent the Hawaiians supposed to get, we never even get the 20 cents. So they pollute, they lie in the least. All they gotta do is write a check and say, this is what the valley is worth and beef. They don't have to clean it based on the, their original lease. They've given federal land that was contaminated to fish and wildlife to turn into a preserve. They did it in Vieques uh, in Puerto Rico. They've done it all over. Not gonna happen here. And going back to the state, they gotta clean them up. None of this BS. All the things they clean. No, they gotta pass our standard of clean. So the battle not over for all of the stuff, whether it's water, whether it's how we behave, and when I was young, we used to have rock fights. 
the winning team would always tell the losing time, team that said, oh, okay, we give up, we quit. No can quit. The rock fight not over. Wow. One of the messages that I heard <clears throat> uh, be shared is this idea of doubt. Um, and how to formulate these actions to mitigate fear, uh, to uh, dissolve our inability to freeze, uh, to, to act, and to uh, really dismantle the things within us um, that cause that fear. And I'm going to call up uh, Makayo Vilapuweba, um, because for us, as today we, we celebrate um, in this event uh, called Malo Monologues, um, the mana that is that comes from actually wearing a malo, and I think you know, in, in the dictionary, um, if there was a word for someone who wears a malo, Makayo would Makayo's picture would be there because I don't think I've ever seen him with pants on, and 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 I think I'm gonna give pass him the mic to kind of just share with us after after listening to what um, um, wisdom comes from our community and the experiences that come from our community. Um, how do you overcome that fear and that doubt um, to be able to do what you do? Alo no kako umakayo ko ino aka kanaka kayo dandi. First, I have to mahalo the kupuna on this panel and and all of the kupuna who made that huli here from the indoctrinated American system to their kanakaness. You guys gave me permission to, um, for everything I'm about to say, why is it that I am able to combat um, my, my daily struggles, you know, both personally, um, you know, I've, I've struggled with addiction, I've st struggled with poverty, I've struggled with, um, a lot of things, personally, right? Um, I've struggled with my identity. I've struggled with um, the the state and the, the criminal justice system, right? But what you guys did, that huli here, allows me to look kavamamu, kavamamu. I get to look back, right? And I now have permission to know who I am to to um, and use that in in my in my moving forward, right? And my wearing my model every day is is really um, the manifestation of the things that I believe in, the things that you guys learned and fought for. <clears throat> Let me start by saying that like my my introduction to the model, right? Uh, I'm a po'e hula, I'm a hula person. And going from Keiki Hula um, into the Kane's class. So from age 12 to 13, um, I was given my model and said that in Kawakahiko, when I left the house of my mother, the Hale Pea, and went to the house of my father, the Hale Mua, I would earn the right to tie my own model. Right? And that would be the sign of my manhood. So one of the reasons why <clears throat> I wear my malo is because I identify as a Hawaiian man. <clears throat> and if in the in the mua, if if you're not wearing your malo, you don't have a voice. Right? And I wanted to have a voice in the Hale Mua. Um so I had no shame wearing my malo. Ex except that it was it, through the practice of hula, it's it's only done in in during performances or or you know some rare ceremonies, right? Sometimes in practice, right? And it was kind of a it was a costume, right? Even though they gave us the moolelo of, of of its significance, it was brief, and we never actually walked through any ceremony, right? It wasn't until um, later on that it that wearing the model started to gain more and more meaning, right? So 
as a hula dancer, our our kuleana is to the forest, right? So Laka is the goddess of the forest, right? It is because of her that things grow. <clears throat> it is through her inspiration that we have our, our movements and our adornments. And so I felt that maybe I have to get into forestry. And then I have to, and then I started to build a connection to food, right? So then wearing a malo in the mala, right, became something for me. And I feel, I feel kind of um, bad for my daughter because she would, uh, I was running a community garden in KPT and every day she would walk home from school and then hit the garden and walk the other way because all of her, her classmates would, would tease and laugh. Right, she never, and she never understood. She never really understood, you know. Um, but I knew that <clears throat> one day she was going to be proud that her her dad wears a malo, right? But even then, like I, I was only wearing my malo in the mountains, in the lobby. I was only wearing it in the garden, right? I was, and, or in performances and ceremony. Um, when Hokulea came back from its worldwide wide voyage. Um, I went to Ala Moana and I was wearing my mala and I was walking back and going through the the shopping center over there on a ward, right? This security guard starts driving up behind me, right? And I have my backpack on, I'm just wearing my mala, no flap in the back. And he goes, excuse me, you going to a performance or something? I was like, oh no, I know where this is going. All right. And so, um, I told him, I told him, no, um, you know, the hokula just came in and he was like, Brian, you cannot be walking around here like that. This is a Hawaiian guy, a Hawaiian brother don't tell me this. I was like, you know, if I identify as a Hawaiian man and wearing a model is the, is the, the sign of that and I'm in Hawaii and I cannot wear my model in Hawaii, where can I wear it? Right? At that moment, I realized telling me to cover up my malo or to cover up my nudity was the same as asking me not to speak Hawaiian in Hawaii. And from then on, I started to train myself to become more and more comfortable wearing my malo in public. Um, and not as an act of defiance, although it is, right? It's more of an opportunity to educate other people, right? to um, open up the conversation that it decolonizes my mind by wearing this model and it de de decolonizes the mind of those around me, right? It gives me an opportunity to tell that um, store manager that no, I cannot put on more clothes, right? And I, and I, and I, get, to sh and I get to share that story. I get to share the significance of this. Um, and only a few times, have they denied me access. One time at Costco, I told them that, they're like, you know what, I can respect that. Can we buy you a pareo? And I said, yes, you can. <laughs> you know? Um, and, and the practice of wearing my model just keeps getting deeper and deeper. We learn, um, right? this, this whole conference or this whole discussion is, is surrounded about what does it mean to hume kamalo? Right? means when I put on my malo, I sharpen my spirit. It's the spears that were thrown at you. It's the spears that are thrown at me. It means when I put on my malo, it, rep it represents the fight that I have for my language, for my children, for my sobriety, my fight to be Hawaiian in Hawaii. And I'm not just Hawaiian, you know what I mean? I'm Filipino, I'm Native American. The Filipinos, we, we, we wear malos too, they're called bahag. My son is Japanese, he wears, they wear a malo, right? My Native American, even my Irish side, you know, they, there's something about their, their kilt that is Significant, uh, significant to them culturally, and the nudity that is associated with it is important. And um, yeah, so when I put on my model, I sharpen my spear, 
and I'm and, and I'm just muck and I'm muck up. You know what I mean? And I, I don't have all the answers. I'm not the best warrior. And you know, so another thing that that um, talk, talk about being a warrior. Something that uh, this this discussion brings up is what does it mean to be a man, right? And um, <clears throat> oh, call my own. Totally smoked that thought. <laughs> but <clears throat> like uh, being a Kani, wearing my malo, I was gonna say something super profound and I forgot it. Any <laughs> but I think that yeah. Yeah, no, but mahalo for your those thoughts because I, I think that uh, that's a good way for us to circle back in the time that we have allotted for this panel um, because that's a question, you know, and, and it's the, the question that after listening to the wisdom shared here on this panel, um, there is still um, that question that's going to linger for all of us. What does it mean to be a man? And, and I think uh, we've had examples for myself We've had great examples of Kane sit up here and, and talk about um, their journey. And through talking about that journey, they provide us an example. And so for all of us, all of you out there, um, understand that it's about how they've walked that answers that question. And it's all been different. But the examples of great men are the best Ha'avina for all of us to learn from. So thank you, Uncle Sparky, and I call it Eric Boka Mahalo.